Okay, ladies, here we go. Are we ready? Um, we are in Judges chapters 9 through 12 this week. Last week during our teaching video time, we looked at chapters 6 through 8. Then this past week for your homework, you guys dug into 9 through 12, and that's where we're going to camp out this week. But I wanted you to notice that 9 really is um, a continuance of 6 through 8. So really that's one unit. And so if you want to pause the video and read 6 through 9 in one chunk in a cohesive unit, you can just to kind of get a better feel of exactly what's going on and how these link up. Um, that's just a, if you want to. Um, if not, we're going to jump right on in. We're going to see where did we leave off with um, Gideon in 6 through 8 last week to help us better interpret what's going on in chapter 9 with Abimelech. Okay, in chapter 9, it, there's just so much information in 6 through 9 that it's really hard to put it into one. That'd be a lot of homework to cover and there's no way we'd get through it uh, in a reasonable amount of time because I talk a lot. So anyway, that's, that's what we're going to kind of do today. We're going to start out looking at where did we leave off with Gideon in 6 through 8 and how does that move us into chapter 9 with Abimelech, okay? We saw Gideon in chapter 6, Judges chapter 6, hiding from the Midianites, scared of them and um, harvesting his, his wheat crop, okay? And so we see Gideon, this frightful, scared person who's called out by an angel and says, oh, valiant warrior. And he's like, what? I'm hiding and I'm scared and I'm a farmer. Um, but anyway, we see, we see that timid, scared person transform into a valiant warrior. In verse 34, Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew his trumpet and he gathered up his troops. That is the key difference right there is the Spirit of the Lord. So Gideon went from scared, re pushing off, I don't want to do this, um, almost trying to manipulate God into, you know, okay, choose somebody different, a lot of hesitation at our house, immediate if it's not immediate, it's not obedient. That was a mouthful. If it's not immediate, it's disobedient. And so um, that's kind of what Gideon, what we saw in him. He kept pushing back the whole time, making excuses. I am not going to do this. I'm not your man, etc. And then we find um, God just kind of ignoring all of his uh, excuses and moving him on in the spirit of the Lord, empowers him, and he calls up his troops and they go in and they are able to um, defeat Midian. All right, so so that's the positive side. However, that that valiant warrior who was on a, a um, mission for national deliverance, he wanted to deliver his people, his nation, from the Midianites. Um, I suggested last week as we kept on going to the end of seven and into chapter eight, looking at that, that he really shifted almost into um, a, a rogue type of bloodthirsty, vengeful soldier. Um, he was just on, on a path headed to destruction. So this, this um, valiant warrior who was empowered by God really seems to have, have transformed yet again, having this personal in vendetta um, uh, wanting to attack because he not only continues pursuing the enemy as they were outside of Israel, but then he also fights within his own community, um, his own Israelites. Now they were from different different tribes, but they were still all Israelites. And he, he beat the fire out of some of them uh, because they wouldn't give him bread, and then he tore down a tower and killed all the men of another city. So, um, just a different way to look at judges. And again, I said last week, you know, this is kind of a new looking at it through a new set of lenses. And so, um, I'm I'm not saying I'm right, and you guys might have some different opinions on that, and that's a okay. It was just a new thing that I felt like the Lord was drawing my attention to. Like, how does this line up with what he tells us to do with one another? So anyway, um, that that's kind of where Gideon was. We see at the end of chapter 8 
that even though he says, I will not be king, verbally he, he um, rejects their offer to a kingdom and a dynasty of, of ruling through his sons. He verbally says no, but behaviorally, we looked at that at the very end of last week and it was super rushed, but we saw some things that he was doing that suggests that behaviorally he was acting like the king. He um, was doing things that a king does. And so setting up that throne kind of gets us into where Abimelech comes in um, with chapter 9. We start seeing that. So Gideon dies there at the end of chapter 8, okay? And... Um, and it says at the very end of chapter 8, verse 34, the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from all their enemies, nor did they show kindness to Gideon's house. Now they use that name Jerubbabel, um, but, but they're talking about Gideon. They don't remember the good things that Gideon had done. Um, and so uh, there's, there's some of that too that, and even if he was ruling and reigning as their king, they're not remembering any of this. So then we get right into nine, and and notice we do not have that, so the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. We don't have that yet because this is a continuance. This is still that same fifth cycle. I think we're in the fifth one, um, the Midianite Gideon cycle, and it's going to keep on going through chapter nine. We'll get a new cycle in a little bit. Um, but we have Abimelech show up on the scene, and we know that he is the son of Gideon, okay? And verses six, uh, one through six of chapter nine um, gets us on the scene here with Abimelech having one real goal, and that is to become the king. Now, if you note, if, if you've been marking God, it, um, I've suggested that in some of the homework, um, I always mark God when I'm when I'm studying and reading passages because I want to see where he's at and what he's doing and um, or how people are using him. You know, um, if you marked God in chapter nine, you're going to see that he is very silent at this point, and I really see it as as more evidence of the spirit having left Gideon way back at the end of chapter seven when he's on this bloodthirsty pursuit. Um, that God is just kind of going hands off and saying, okay, Israel, I'm just going to kind of let you destroy yourselves. Um, so we don't really see God in here. He's pretty much silent. So just keep that in mind as we're looking at what are these people doing? If God is remaining silent on this, are they doing things that God is calling them to do? Um, or are they just doing things that they think is right, which t is what the book of Judges, what we see so often. All right, so we've got Abimelech, and he goes to Shechem, all right, and that is where his mother's people were from. So remember, Gideon had a harem of wives and lots of children. Then he went and he took a concubine from Shechem, a Canaanite female from Shechem. I think she was a Canaanite. Now I might have that wrong, so don't hold me to that. Okay, but they go to Shechem and takes um, takes um, this woman from Shechem. I think I got confused on her background there, uh, and and brings her into. Um, oh, sorry, Abimelech goes to Shechem. I've got myself my brain's going and my mouth just keeps talking. I'm gonna pause there. So Abimelech goes to his mom's people to convince these leaders of Shechem to to appoint him the king. Okay, so he goes, he's he's um, addressing first his relatives and then getting them to talk to the elders there. They're going to give him money, and when they give him money, then he's going to go hire some worthless men to follow him, and then they're going to these guys with Abimelech and these worthless men are going to go back over and they're going to kill Gideon's sons. Okay? Um, all of them except one. And, and so in this act, we see that this is a move, or this would be very similar. It, this might not have been his motivation, but it kind of looks like it. Um, it just doesn't tell us in Scripture. But this is the same type of move that any person who was pursuing the kingship 
would have done with the royal family. He would have destroyed them all, killed them all, take wiped them out so that then he would be in place. Um, and so um, that's, that looks like what Abimelech is doing. He's gone back with these uh, worthless men to remove any threat to the kingdom that the um, sons of Gideon might have. And then in verse 6, we see that the men of Shechem make Abimelech king. All righty, there we have it. Um, so, um, so he is made king. And then we see right away in verse 7, we see the only remaining son of Gideon, Jotham, um, show up. And Jotham happened to be the youngest son, and he had escaped from this brutal slaying. Um, and, and honestly, girls, I don't know if you saw this, but in chapter five, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter nine, verse five, it says that, um, Abimelech, uh, killed 70, the 70 sons on one stone, but the youngest, so 69 on one stone. The, um, commentaries talked about the brutality of that. So it was almost like not in war or in battle type of thing, but they were brought out to be executed, um, all, all one right after another, right after another. So you're watching this happen. Um, anyway, so just a, a brutal, ruthless type of situation going on. So Jotham comes on the scene and in verses seven through 21, we see him, um, speaking to the people of Shechem. He's going to give them this, this fable, this parable, I, those might be two different things, but in my head, a fable and a parable are pretty similar. So I kind of use that interchangeably. Maybe not supposed to. But let's look real fast. A couple contrasts with Abimelech and Jotham. Notice that Abimelech, we talked about how his name means my father is king. Jotham means the Lord is perfect. Now this does not mean just because his name he was named that doesn't mean that Jotham is acting out with the word of God. Because again, we do not see God saying, Jotham, go and talk to them, or Jotham had a word from the Lord, or Jotham prayed. And, you know, we don't see any of that. We see um, just Jotham doing it. Now, Jotham does uh, call out to the people of Shechem, which is a contrast here. Um, if, you, if you think about Abimelech, he was really driven by self-interest. He went to the men of Shechem because he wanted to be king. That was his own personal agenda. Whereas in verse 7, we see Jotham say, Listen to me, O men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. So there almost seems to be a concern for the people of Shechem. Why are you appointing him king? Don't do it. You need to listen so that God will listen to you. Now, I don't know what he was trying to get out of it if he wanted them to appoint him as king because he took off after he delivered this message. He was gone. Um, so it's almost like he wasn't going to get anything out of this. Um, so there might be a concern for the people of Shechem. <coughs> Abimelech made all, <coughs> excuse me, all kinds of seductive promises, you know, when he approached these guys. Hey, um, and use some of those, look, don't you, wouldn't you rather have me? I'm part your blood, you know, versus these other guys. When you want one king instead of 70 ruling over you, all this kind of stuff that made all these implications of promises. Whereas Jotham is just saying, let's put our hope in God. If you listen, God might listen to you. Um, and then, and then we see that Abimelech has gone on a, on a, a an attack and killed all these people. Jotham really doesn't even verbally attack Abimelech. He calls out to the men and says, listen, be wise, but he doesn't really say um, much. There's not really an attack going on in here. Uh, so that's just kind of an interesting note to kind of do. That's a comparison and contrast that you can do as you're studying scripture. If you've never done one of those before, check out two different characters and see how are they alike and how are they different. Um, and you might find some interesting things. Let's keep going with chapter 9. 
because we're getting into the parable. Now, I'm just going to summarize this parable because there's a whole lot in there that you might want to go digging out yourself. But basically, in this fable, the trees kind of represent Shechem. Now, this is not a one-to-one -one correlation going on, so not everything is neat and tidy, but just kind of go with the general gist of the idea. Um, the trees in the fable are seeking a king. So Shechem didn't really go out seeking a king. Uh, Abimelech kind of came to them and says, hey, don't you want me to be king instead of these guys over here? Shechem was kind of doing their own um, governmental organizational type of thing, but it's the same idea, okay? And, um, and the first three trees that Jotham uses in the parable happen to be the three most valuable trees in that area. The olive tree, the fig tree, and uh, I lost, oh, the vine, the grapevine, okay? Three uh, most valuable producers, all right? And each of these trees in the fable or parable refuse to become the king of the trees because they knew that the trees needed them in the work that they were already doing. If the olive tree decided to stop producing olives and rule over all the trees, well, then the trees were not going to, then, then humanity was not going to have the olives that it so desperately needed. Okay? So these three very significant, very valuable trees recognized the importance that they had in a different role. That their role was not going to be to be king. They were needed in other acts. And they were all acts of service. They were trying to do good things for the people versus having the people bring honor and glory to themselves. Okay, so those are the first three trees. Um, and then, the, um, then the, the trees who were looking for trees, you know, go to the bramble. And that bramble is just a worthless, it's small, it's thorny, it does not provide any kind of shelter, it doesn't do anything. And the, the bramble makes all these crazy claims, like, come on, come here and I will protect you and I will cover you up. Uh, it can't even get over the trees. You know, so it's, it's really funny when you read what the bramble um, suggests that they can do. Uh, and so the bramble here is arrogant and offers all this ridiculous protection um, but then it also threatens the trees and says, you know, um, I'm going to burn you up if you trick me or whatever. So um, Jotham is basically telling Shechem, you're going to get what you asked for in Abimelech. So be careful. You're going you're gonna to get what you deserve. And then Jotham takes off and runs. Now, verses 22 through 55, the re which is the rest of chapter 9, is really a fly through of exactly what happens and we see what we see in actual events that Jotham's fable or parable takes place in the life of Abimelech. Um, these words are fulfilled right here in these verses. Again notice that God is really not mentioned as sending Jotham. So Jotham may be just speaking his own thoughts however God can still use those words to accomplish what God's plans and goals were. So whether God laid those words on Jotham's heart and in his mind and then he went to speak them so that then, you know, the plan would happen or that God in his all-knowing self knew that Jotham was going to speak these words and then fulfilled them. So we don't really know where God played in because, but just remember, God is sovereign. He's over everything and he's in control of everything. He uses people. He uses vessels to carry about his goals and his plans. So he is going to bring punishment to Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Um, and he may have been just using this human voice of Jotham to bring about that message. Either way, God is sovereign over everything. Notice in verses 56 and 57. What do we see? The, so God's, we haven't seen God saying anything or, or doing anything, but then we see in these last two verses, then God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father in killing his 70 brothers. God, God took vengeance on Abimelech. He killed those 70 boys. 
And also God returned all the wickedness of the men of Shechem on their heads, and the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel, came upon them. So here we see whether God was um, actively engaged in creating this, or if he was just kind of standing off and allowing it to happen, Either way, he either causes it or allows it, but everything that comes our way goes through the hands of God. Um, but we see in those last two verses that it was God who did it. God repaid the wickedness um, of both Abimelech and the men of che Shechem. All right? Um, and so Abimelech dies, and um, we see here, it's interesting, what else do we see for the first time in this book? that God does not act on mercy. For the first time, the people get what they deserve. Remember, all this deliverance that has happened, chapter after chapter, deliver after deliver, is God hearing their cry, hearing their cry of help get me out of the situation, not necessarily a cry of repentance, right? And God goes and delivers, but he only delivers because he's gracious and merciful. They didn't deserve it, they were in constant apostasy. They were in constant idolatry. They constantly turned from him, you know, save us and then let us go back. But yet God is merciful. And in this chapter, for the first time, we see God allowing people to get exactly what they deserve, bringing that punishment on them. And um, just kind of one of those interesting differences that we see. Um so we have Abimelech dying, okay? That gets us to chapter 10, and it says right here, now after Abimelech died, there's an immediate, remember, again, notice what's missing. We don't have that statement yet, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's not there yet, so this is, this is still within that same cycle, that fifth cycle, yep, this cycle, I'm getting myself confused, um, with Midian and Gideon, Midianites and Gideon, and so here we go. We've got two new guys on the scene. Now, real fast, I want to kind of do a little tangent here. These chapters, chapters 10 through 12, are going to get us into that sixth cycle. We're going to see it in just a minute over here in verse 6 of chapter 10. Okay? Um, that's going to be our new cycle. But we have bookends. We have these two governors at the beginning of chapter 10, ending out Gideon's cycle, a book in there, and then we're going to have three more at the at the book end at the end of chapter 12. Okay? And and then this guy, Jephthah, I keep having to look at it because I don't want to call him that. Jephthah uh, is sandwiched between these five governors, two on this end, three on this end. And these five governors are much more like local rulers. And really, they're seen in times of peace. So Gideon had driven out the Midianites. I kept putting them that way. Gideon had driven out the Midianites. And now there's, then Abimelech came on and there was internal struggle within the nation. But there was no outside enemy forces. Okay? Then we have this relative time of peace where there's not an outside enemy coming in. Doesn't mean it was peaceful and everybody's getting along in Israel, but we didn't have that outside enemy attacking. Um, and so we have these guys ruling then um, at the front end of it, and then um, on the back side of Jephthah at the end of chapter 12, we've got three more, uh, again, kind of ruling during this time of peace. Again, note that the people are not necessarily following God um, in these times of peace. There's just not that outside pressure from anybody else. Now, so why are, the, why are these guys just briefly mentioned, but then there's these other judges who have longer um, accounts or much more detail given? Um, go back. This can be part of the literary device. And when I say literary device, I don't mean that this was just man's concoction. God uses literary device to tell us things too, okay? So we know that we've got seven, we've talked about having seven cycles, which kind of points to the totality, that this is a national situation going on, the totality of the nation, all of them were, um, were 
turning from God. All of them were practicing apostasy, idolatry, refusing to submit to God. It was a national situation. Okay, the other idea too is, so we have seven cycles, but we really do have 12 guys named. Now, not all the tribes are necessarily mentioned, um, but a lot of them are. That idea of 12, though, gives us that liter literary device saying that this involved, there's 12 tribes, there's 12 guys. This is a whole national situation going on, okay? So, and just because these five are briefly mentioned or they work during times of peace doesn't mean that they were less important but it does give us a better picture of it wasn't constant enemy attacking, warfare, turmoil. There were times of peace within the nation over these three, four hundred year um, um, times of the judges. Okay, so that just kind of helps paint us a whole big picture that we talked about weeks ago when we um, started in on the context of judges. These five are not insignificant but they do communicate that purpose. Now, two of them on each side, um, J.R., who we're gonna talk about in a minute, and Isbon, that's J.R.'s on the front end of Japheth, and Isbon is on the back end, they really do speak to having this regal, royal kind of personality or, um, or, or a rightful ruler in contrast to Japheth. So I want you to see some of those contrasts. If you didn't pick up on some things like that, go back. Use that chart on the judges. You might have to add a few more details to actually really get a good picture, but go back and contrast these guys. Look, how are they similar? How are they different? What message does that teach us? So we're gonna get in and dig real fast in these guys, and it's not gonna to take too long on the first two. So Tola, shows up it says tola the son of da, 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 da all this kind of stuff he arose to save israel and he lived in this place and he was from ephraim okay not a whole lot he's got two two verses about him but basically we see tola first of all means worm so don't name your kid that okay and he is from the tribe of issachar living in the land of ephraim those are just some tribal terms he did rise up to save Israel, but notice there's no mention of God raising him up. So this could have been, hey, Tola's a good leader, let's follow him type of deal. There's no enemy mentioned, but it says to save Israel. He's coming off the heels of Abimelech. Maybe he's trying to help save Israel from themselves, you know, to bring peace after all this turmoil with Abimelech. All right. Um, he rules in Ephraim, which is right across from Shechem. So all this mess that's been going on in Shechem, that may be what's going on. He's trying to make things better, trying to bring peace for the area. All we know is that he ruled for 23 years, but that is some exact um, numbers. Remember in the past we've said when it says like 40 years, when they're rounded numbers, they could be symbolic of a generation um, this one, because it's an exact numbering 23, it could be emphasizing um, instead of an approximation. All right, it just tells us this is it. So basically, he lived, he ruled, he died, he was buried. The end of Tola. Then Jair comes on, and his name means may enlighten. Um, it does not tell us what tribe he's from. It really focuses in more on the geographical location. He's from that area of Gilead. Now, Gilead would have been over near where the tribe of Manasseh was, um, but Gad was over there too, and I think even part of Reuben. So I, I don't know that we really know exactly what tribe he was from, um, but we know he's over in that area. And he, he rules in an area called Hevoth, Jair, that's in verse four, okay? Which is important when we get over into Jephthah. These are all in about the same area. So it, the author may be, God may just be telling us that now we're talking about this little area of Israel. But again, this is indicative of the entire nation. Um, the, so this is just the example that we're using. Um, he did not record everything that happened in these three, 400 years across the entire nation. He selected 
key events, key people that he wanted to have recorded. Now, Jephthah, no, Jair, sorry, Jair had 30 sons, 30 donkeys, 30 cities. Okay, lots of 30s in here. Um, so there's several different possibilities, but the, the agreed upon thought is that it's just a real truly a picture of peace and prosperity. Um, these sons rode on the donkeys. They weren't using them as pack animals for, you know, hard, strenuous work. They, they were leisurely able to just kind of ride along on a donkey. Go back a few judges and see, um, even with Deborah, remember the people were hiding. Um, even with Gideon that we just talked about, they were, they were in caves. I think with Deborah it said that the, um, the highways were abandoned, you know, in, in, Chapter 6 with Gideon, it said they were hiding in caves and in the mountains. So this, the fact that they were out riding on the riding on the donkeys, which are slow animals, you know, um, kind of indicates that they weren't worried about an outside enemy. Um, so that peace and prosperity is a direct contrast to what's going to occur here when Jephthah comes on the scene. Um, but it's in that same region, that same area, so it almost indicates that the people were not ready for the trouble that was to come. So that's kind of those two governors there. It just paints us a different picture. There were also times of peace and prosperity, but people weren't always looking for what trouble is coming next. And that's where we're going to pick up. Look in verse 6 of chapter 10. Here's where we have our sentence. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Astra and got into their idolatry. We see that cycle again happening. Now look in verse 6. You see um, a lot of names that I'm not going to read, but there's about seven. There are seven um, members that are listed here of what Israel served. And that links us back to, if you guys want to go for a dig, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, and you see it linking them to the Canaanites. And you can almost watch it parallel down there in, in Deuteronomy 7. Again, it's talking about that totality of national idolatry. These Israelites were now fully Canaanized. Okay, we've got them worshiping seven different gods. Again, seven is that number of completion. So the God is telling us, perhaps in this, that that it's all over the place. And we weren't just a little bit acting like the Canaanites. Now we are full throttle being much more like a Canaanite nation, which is going to make more sense if we look at it through those lens. It makes more sense of what we can interpret with Jephthah, things that I just didn't recognize before. Again, I don't think we have to throw out everything that we've ever thought, but just look at it through a different set of lenses. And that's um, what I'm wanting you guys to see in, in these video times. Okay, um, verses 10 through 16, we're going to see... No, that's not right. Um... Oh, I got it. We're going to see through these chapters um, several different dialogues. Jephthah dialoguing with some different people. Verses 10 through 16 is the first of those dialogues, okay? Um, and each of these dialogue chunks is going to show a conflict or a confrontation and a resolution. So here we go. Verse 10, and this is actually... Israel crying out to Yahweh. So it's, Jephthah is not even on the scene yet, but it's still one of those. And then Jephthah is going to have some more of these conflict resolution type things. So in verse 10, we see that the sons of Israel cried out to Lord. Now look at what they say this time. This is something new. All right. They say, we have sinned against you for indeed we have forgotten our God and we have served the Baals. Okay, this is the first time where you see a hint of confession. Is there true repentance? We don't know. Are they just saying it? Have things gotten so bad that they're willing, like, oh, wait a minute, we got to confess some stuff. You know, we don't know at this point, right? It's a very general confession. 
Notice that there is not a plea for forgiveness. There is not a plea for grace. They're just saying, hey, we've sinned against you. We've forsaken you and we've served these bales. We're, we're just admitting our, our sin here. Okay, but there's not there's not an asking of forgiveness. They're just confessing. So could they just be manipulating with this confession? We got to read on to see, right? Um, but on the surface, it sounds good. Like, yay, okay, they've cried out to God and they've confessed. This is really good. Yay, Israelites, you're getting better. Mm, I don't think so. Look at verse number 11. 11 through 14 is where God responds to them. Okay, and he responds to them going back and saying, look, this is how I have delivered you. And then he gets on to them and scolds them, right? Um, so let, let's see. Uh, verse 11, did I not deliver? And he goes on and lists all those. And then he says in verse 13, and you've forsaken me and you served. So he's scolding them. He's getting on to them. And then, um, and then he rejects, okay? Um, verse 14, he says, go and cry out to those other gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you. So this is something new, Right? So in the past, the people would cry out with a help us, get us out of this situation. And God in his grace and his mercy would come in and deliver them, knowing that it was not a cry of repentance, not a cry of, of humility. It was just a cry for we're in trouble. We need help. Get us out of help. I mean, get us out of trouble, right? Okay, track with me on this. I wish we were face to face because then I would know if this is making sense. Um, but here they are. They're not even confessing anything. They're not humbling. But yet God, in his grace and in his mercy, delivers them out of trouble, right? Now, here we are, where verbally it looks like they're confessing. They have just said, we forsook you, and we've been serving these other gods. We've been in idolatry. And how does God respond to that? He says, did I not deliver you before? Yet you still have turned from me? Go talk to them. Go talk to those other gods. I'm not going to deliver you. Almost the idea of I'm done. Okay? So, why? They're finally uttering a confession, and now God's saying, mm -mm, not going to do it. Whereas over here, they're just asking for help, and he was gracious to do it. So that to me says, we've got something big going on. And what would that be in my mind, okay, is this is not true repentance. They are, manip they are giving a confession to manipulate God, all right? Because if we truly are confessing and we're truly seeking forgiveness and we're approaching God with humility, what does the rest of this book tell us that God will do? He will answer us. Confess your sins and he will forgive them, right? So here, there's got to be something else going on. And we can't just look at the outside and hear what the people are saying. God is the one who knows our hearts. God knew their hearts. God knew what was going on there. Okay? Just like he knows ours. And so we might have, you guys ever caught yourself doing that? And I know I have. I know I have. Where I said, okay, God, oh, I really, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. Will you help me this time? And then I'm right back into what I just said I wouldn't do because I got bailed out. Okay? So it's not like the Israelites are the only bad people around. Right? Um, but isn't it interesting? Because that never made sense to me. I'm like, why all of a sudden? You know? Well, actually, go back to I never really noticed that they were not crying out in humility before. And so when I started piecing that together, then when I came to this part, I was like, wait a minute. But now they're confessing and he's saying no. So... Okay, Krista, read on. Dig deeper. Why would God reject it? Why would he get on to them and scold them and say, mm -mm, not going to do it? Because he knows their hearts, and their hearts have not turned to him. Okay, let's keep going. Sorry, I got carried away with that. Okay, that gets us. All right, so, so still at this point, we may not be following that. Let's look at verse 15 and 16. So then the sons of Israel say to the Lord, we've sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us this day. Have they yet asked for forgiveness? Have they yet asked for mercy and grace? They're asking for deliverance, 
But they're also saying, do whatever you want to do to us, but get us out of this. So, yeah, we've sinned. Would you take care of this big problem, and then we'll deal with the, whatever else you want to do to us because of our sin? Maybe that's how we approach God, too. You know, okay, I've got this hot mess going on at work or at home or financially. God, if you'll take care of that, I know I've been messing up with you, but you're so good and gracious and forgiving that I know I'll be okay because you'll just forgive me. So clean up that mess and then you can do whatever you want to do with me. Almost like flippantly expecting God to just be nice to us. Does that, I'm hope, I hope that's tracking with you guys and you can see some of that personal application there. So what is Gideon, um, Israel, what did the Israelites do in verse 16? They put away all their foreign gods and they served the Lord and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Okay, so we see in here that they gave lip service, then they actually did, they took care of their idolatry, they put them away, and they, they seemed to serve the Lord. That's what it says. So they're trying to do some things, um, but yet we don't see God for a while, all right? He is still present, he's still active, but um, we're not seeing that they're really legitimately um, going with this, all right? So then, um, then we cruise on down and we get into verses 17 and 18 gonna, are going to lead us into chapter 11. So the people have cried out to God and he has scolded them and he has said, no, let them go serve you. I don't know who's speaking to, you know, did God in an audible, uh, this just hit me. I don't know why it's just now hitting me. Um, but who said these things to them from God? I'll have to go look that up because that never crossed my mind. I'm just thinking God just had this conversation with them. Uh, audible voice, you know, whatever. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, so then what do they do? So they said, okay, well, we've talked to God. We've put away our idols and now we're serving God. So who's going to deliver us? We got to find somebody who'll deliver us. I mean, that's, they're on you know, God hasn't raised anybody up. Let's go find somebody, right? And that gets us over to chapter 11, where we meet up with Jephthah. So we see him in verses 1 through 3. We get a little bit of information about Jephthah. And um, you, can, you can go back and look, about, look at those and see, check out the sin in Israel. The depravity there. They are deep. It's deep in these, just basically from his heritage. You know, um, his dad was from Gilead. His mom was a harlot. So his father had practiced immoral, sexual immorality with a prostitute. Now, we don't know if she was a, we don't know any of her background. So was she an Israelite? Sometimes women were forced in, forced into prostitution because they had no other way of making money. I'm not saying that that was an acceptable thing, but because here's the deal. Israel should have been taking care of their widows and their orphans. And the laws that God lined up, if, if, um, if a husband died and she had no children, then they were supposed to have this kinsman redeemer, this next person in line to come in and, and marry her. We see that in the book of Ruth, which happens during the time of Judges. You know, so Israel, if she was an Israelite and she had been out of desperation chosen to go into prostitution because she had no other way of making money, then the, the Israelites there had failed. They had been disobedient to God because they hadn't done their job. Then if, if an Israelite man went into this Israelite woman, think of the horror of that the immorality there. So not only was he supposed to be taking care of her, but now he's also taken advantage of her. If she was a Canaanite, then she would have probably been a part of pagan Canaanite idolatry, part of their worship to their Canaanite gods. And now we've got this Israelite going in, practicing the Canaanite rituals. Okay, so any way you look at it, it's really bad. And I didn't mean to go into detail on that. Y'all go and dig that out. See what, see what happens. Then we have the brothers. So he has a son, okay, through this harlot, which is not good, but yet it's a child, okay? And the, the lineage, go, the inheritance goes through the father, not through the mother. So now his half-brothers are refusing to allow him to, ha they're breaking all kinds of Jewish law. 
let's keep going okay so check that out and see where they are then we're going to get into these next the next four dialogues here the first one the verses 5 through 11 we have Jephthah uh, in dialogue with his own countrymen these um, these brothers these uh, men of Gilead who were driving him out wanted him to have nothing to do with their inheritance now they've come back begging him to be their their leader not their king they do not want to give him too much go and look at that dialogue and see what they're promising he knows he's got the upper hand and he gets more anyway he's negotiating this conflict and resolution going back and forth and in this dialogue Jephthah gets everything that he wants keep on going in verses 12 through 28 now Jephthah is been given the he's taken the leadership to get rid of the Ammonites the enemy right and um, and he goes to them and he's going to try to do it in a diplomatic way he's going to use words to try to resolve the conflict between Am the Ammonites and the Israelites uh, without having to go to war which is a good thing you know um, but here he he um, does not get what he wants he gets a very negative response from Ammon and then this pushes them into the war okay so which is in Israel is successful why is Israel successful here's verse 29 where we see God now now notice that um, in verse 21 and 23 and 24 we have mentions of God but this is all um, in that that discussion so Jephthah may be using the name of God and what God had done before in order to convince the Ammonites not to go to war with them. So this isn't really God on the scene yet. It's just them using God. Okay, but you get down to verse 29 and we see that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So even though God said, nope, you go cry out to your other gods, let them deliver you, God comes on the scene in his grace and in his mercy, and he is going to empower and he is going to deliver. God is no longer passive um, in this. Remember, just because he's passive does not mean he's not in control. I am not saying that. He is sovereign and in control of everything, but sometimes he passively sits back and allows things to happen that we deserve to happen, right? Okay, so... Um, that was that second dialogue. The third dialogue we see in verses 29 through 40. And this is where Je Je Jephthah has a dialogue with God and with his daughter. It's, a, it's the dad-daughter dialogue. Now, in verse 30, he makes this vow to the Lord. Okay? And he vows that he would sacrifice the first thing that comes out of his home. Hello, who's on the phone? I don't know how to turn the ringer off, so it's going to ring two more times. Um, and it's going to tell us who's ringing. Uh, anyway, so, um, so he makes this vow, and he says that whatever comes out of the doors of my house, I will offer in a burnt sacrifice. Okay? And we think, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, he's thinking a cow or a pig or, well, not a pig because he's an Israelite a cow or sheep or whatever and then but anyway as i got to exploring this and thinking it through if jeff jephthah is fully canaanized right and just using his head knowledge of yahweh okay but he's fully canaanized he's living like them he's watching them worship he's doing all this kind of stuff um part of their worship that he would have seen would have been child sacrifice. The Canaanites, um, I think it doesn't matter who the God is, um, we're going to keep going because I can't think of it right now, but that was an element of their worship. And when they would bring their child for child sacrifice, um, it was to show complete devotion to that pagan God. Okay, and that would have not been a rash decision. It would have been thought through and all that kind of stuff. The commentary that I was reading kind of pointed that this could have very well been exactly what Jephthah was wanting. Now, when you read on down, it looks like he's really sad, okay? Um, and we're going to kind of get there too, but um, we're going to see 
this is something there. All right, let me let me look at this real quickly. Um, so this may have been a way for Jephthah to again manipulate God. If I offer God the first thing that comes out of my house as a burnt offering, maybe he'll give me victory. Maybe he'll give me the things that I want. It doesn't line up. It doesn't make sense to us, but we've got to think outside of rational. Okay, um, because people were doing whatever they thought was right in their own eyes, right? And they were sinning in ways that we cannot even comprehend. And so it wasn't like uh, me and you who, uh, who have been studying the Word, and I'm not saying we're perfect by any means, but, but my heart truly is one to be seeking God in His Word, desiring to do what He would have me to do, and so there's a rational thought that says, well, of course I'm not going to offer the first thing that comes out of my house. You know, I'm not going to make that kind of a promise. Why, why wouldn't Jephthah say, okay, God, if you'll give me victory, I'll kill all the Ammonites. I'll sacrifice all of them for you. You know, that was part of war. I'm not saying it was right or it sounded nice, but he didn't even do that. So, um... Anyway, we see, we see here, this is a monologue, though. God is not responding back. Jephthah is just talking and making these promises to God. God never comes back and says to him, yes, I will give you victory. Or, yes, I will take that sacrifice. I'll take that vow. You know, God is really, he's completely silent here. Look at verse 35. Once they, once they get the victory... Now we know that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in verse 29. Verse 32, the Lord gave the enemy into his hand. So we see that. Down here in verse 35, when she comes out the door, the daughter, his only daughter, he says, alas, my daughter, you, ha you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. He totally blames the daughter. She doesn't know what vow he made. He does not take responsibility. Oh, I made a really rash vow there. Probably shouldn't have said that one, right? Um, but he, he blames her. Now, here's the other thing, and we looked at this in our homework a little bit, but he did have several options, okay? One option is that he didn't have to keep the vow, which would have brought a curse on him because God. we talked about we looked in our homework about how, how um, important vows are to God. So when we make a vow, we're expected to keep it. Okay, so if I break my vow, I can expect discipline and a curse to come on me, but I wouldn't have killed my daughter, right? So that's an option. I'm not saying it's the best option. It's just an option. The second option is that he could have gone, you saw this in your homework, he could have followed Moses' law, and brought money or tribute to the high priest and paid off his vow with money instead of his daughter's life. And the third option is the one that he took was that he went ahead and fulfilled the vow and sacrificed his daughter. Now option two clearly is the most reasonable option and the one that is supported by scripture. Moses gave that. If you make a vow and then you realize you cannot keep that vow, then there's a way to compensate for that and still be obedient to God and not under a curse. All right, so let's keep on going. Um, but he's devastated and uh, blames her. And um, anyway, y'all can do some digging there if you want to see what this whole thing about going two months and all this stuff. But basically, he just cut off his lineage. So again, this is a great application for us. Jephthah was concerned for the here and the now, right here, what he could see. He did not look up and think down the road. Because if he sacrifices this daughter, that's all he had. That's his whole lineage. Now, I don't know if he thought, well, I'll just have more kids later on. We have no idea what age he was or anything like that. But really, he's cutting it off. Because if he has no one to pass on his inheritance to, his line stops. You know, so um, it just it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, of why he did it. We get to verse or chapter 12 verses 1 through 6 and we have this last dialogue with um, Jephthah and Ephraim and we talked about how the Ephraimites 
This was a few chapters ago. These guys are just arrogant. They're self-centered. They whine. They whine because they're not invited to participate in war. But then when they actually go and fight, they are not very good at it. Um, anyway, so we see that the war with Ammon is complete. Jephthah and Israel have won the battle, and he's now kind of ruling over them. Um, maybe not as king, but he is in control. Um, all of Israel does not agree with this. And so we get into another war, but it's within Israel. It's within the people. Ephraim is whining because um, Jephthah didn't invite him to go against and fight against Gilead. And in their jealousy and in, resen in their se um, resentment, they seek their own self-importance. We wanted to be a part of this. We wanted to... Um, maybe we wanted to get some of the benefits of the war, the the um, the bounty, the booty, the bounty. What do you get when you win a war? I can't think, remember what it's called. Anyway, all that stuff. I don't know, but they're whining about it. And Jephthah does try to diplomatically get his way out of this. Again, he tries to use words diplomacy, respect. Let's think this through. Um, but they are not going to listen. They are insulted. Uh, and so they go against um, the, the, the army of Gilead has already come in. I mean, sorry, Ephraim has already raised up their army. So Jephthah brings his army and 42,000 Ephraimites are killed. And then um, chap uh, verse 7, chapter 12, verse 7, it ends with Jephthah judged Israel for six years and then he died and he was buried. Okay, that brings the end of Jephthah. And again, now listen, there's no mention that there's rest in the land. We don't have that. So he may not have driven them completely out. Am Ammon, the Ammonites might not have been completely and clearly defeated. Jephthah paints, there's a quote, okay, that I love from the commentary that I'm using, which I don't have here right here. But it says, Jephthah paints a pathetic picture of stupidity, brutality, ambition, and self-centeredness, okay? Again, um, if we're tracking with the cycle of sin going round and round and the Israelites going deeper and deeper and deeper into their sin, the deliverers that are coming out of this are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And here we have Jephthah, okay? Um, stupid, he, he brought on his own, in his own arrogance, he brought about this stupid vow, right? Brutal. Um, it, it brutally killed his own daughter, right? He's got ambition and self-centeredness. That's all about fighting these wars and, and wanting to win and being focused on himself. Uh, so God, even though God's primarily silent in these chapters, we do still see him graciously and mercifully just delivering them. Um, go back and look at how Jephthah has similarities to both Gideon and Abimelech. Um, it might be interesting to do a chart. Do all three of those guys. See, how are they similar? How are they different? Put Jephthah in the middle. How is he similar to Gideon? How is he similar to Abimelech? And you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of similarities there. Um, and so that might be interesting. Another thing, you might want to go back and, and mark or look at where you marked God and see um, where is God working, clearly, where it's God working, where is man maybe trying to manipulate God, where is man trying to use God, versus where is man really clearly hearing from God. Those might be a couple little things that you want to go back through and look at. Um, do and, and just see, do they seem to be culturally religious or sincere in it? Um, go check it out, and then do some self um reflection there see where you are now real fast i have no idea what time i started um real fast let's cruise through these last three uh governors okay because they're very it's very short it's our other bookends so we already said is ibsen ibsen in verses 8 through 10 he is another total contrast to jephthah so you have tola and jair and jair is a contrast to jephthah all right, and then the other bookend, Ibsen, is another, excuse me, total contrast. Ibsen, it paints us again a picture of the ideal family. 
Um, when I say ideal family, they have 30 sons and 30 daughters. I don't mean we have to have 30 sons and 30 daughters, but it's that idea of family there. And it talks about how he gave them in marriage um, outside the family. Now that, that may not be like outside of Israel, okay? It's still, there's not an indication that this was a bad thing. It's that idea of he is bringing in, in wives for his sons and sending his daughters out, maybe trying to um, establish um, alliances, maybe trying to gain more political influence, but again, not necessarily manipulating his children um, because it doesn't necessarily paint a negative. Uh, but we do see he's got 30 sons, 30 daughters, and he, he judged Israel for seven years, and he must have had a large area that he judged. Then we have Elion, Elon, sorry, Elon, and he just has a couple verses. All we know about him is he, he's from Zebulonite. He's from Zebulun, and he judged for 10 years. Then he died and he was buried. Not a whole lot to be said about him, right? And, and more of a governor. Again, these are times of peace, more than likely. Then you have Abdon, um, with the last few verses here of chapter 12, and he's another example of that family with lots of sons. He has 40 sons, 30 grandsons, and they rode on 70 donkeys, okay? That's what you want your family to look like. Just kidding. Um, but this, again, paints that picture of peace and prosperity. They're riding on the donkeys. It's a leisure time. They have built um, an area. They're growing their families. Um, but we know that this deep peace is not going to last, okay? Because we're going to get right into chapter 13 with, again, the sons did evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's where you're going to look next week um, and uh, as we look into the life of Samson. So looking at these last little chapters that we did, 9 through 12, we can clearly see that the people were doing what they thought was right in their own eyes and so did the judges so did these guys that were watching as the people continue to deepen in their deeds of evil so the deliverers continue to decline in character i just was saying that right but we see what do we see that's constant god is constant through it all he continues to deliver out of grace and out of mercy alone they do not deserve it at all but he does it. We also see him get less involved in their lives. We see more silence from God throughout this. It doesn't mean that he's not in control because he is sovereign and that does not change. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to be involved. He does. That's why he keeps bringing in the enemies. Okay, come on. People wake up. Come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Um, but as they're deepening in their sin, he keeps getting more and more silent because he cannot be in sin. All right? We see him less involved. How long is God going to tolerate their sin and disobedience? It is really a sad, sad state. What can we learn then from that, from these accounts? Okay, if we're not careful, we get deeper and deeper and deeper into our sin and God goes gets let, um, more and more quiet in our lives. Again, doesn't mean he's not there. Doesn't mean that he's not waiting for us to call out to him and he's going to be right there with us. Um, but you see a very sad picture painted, but God, my favorite words, but God. But God is gracious and he's merciful and he won't leave them alone. Okay, let's pray real fast and then I'm going to let you guys get into chapters 13 through 16 this week and check out Mr. Sampson. Lord, I thank you so much for who you are and for um, each of these ladies here. I thank you for what you're teaching us through your word about our own selves and in our own lives and how we can apply it all. Um, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to give me a desire to know you and to seek you and to serve you because I know that that only comes from you. Father, I love you. We want to worship you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. See you guys next week.